Funding for this program is provided by Annenberg CPB to advance excellent teaching. It was a time of anarchy, of murder, arson, pillage, rape, a time when the world seemed to fall apart. Even the church depended on the barbarian tribes who ruled the West. As the barbarians were Christianized, the church became more barbarous. The Dark Ages, this time on the Western tradition. Now UCLA professor Eugen Weber's continuing journey through the history of Western civilization. The final collapse of the Roman Empire in the West came in the fifth century under the pressure of German barbarians. Three centuries later, on Christmas Day of the year 800, a German was crowned in Rome as Emperor of the West. He was Charles, King of the Franks, whom history knows as Charles the Great or Charlemagne, and whose glorious reign was for the times a paragon of stability. But the period in between those 300 years from collapse to coronation, this period is known as the Dark Ages, partly because we don't know much about it and partly because it was just that, dark and bloody. The economy had gone to pot, the social fabric fell to pieces as much by internal as by external disruption, material culture decayed as we can see by new settlement patterns with a lot of farms and villages on the best lands deserted for upland places old strongholds that had been inhabited since the Stone Age, the like of which came back into use not because you could hope to make a better living there, but simply because you had a better chance to stay alive. That's what the general situation looks like, or we guess it looked like. At the political level, you remember that the Roman Empire in the West had been replaced by smaller barbarian kingdoms. Visigoths in Spain, who were later gobbled up by the Arabs around 700, Lombards in Italy, Franks and Burgundians in Gaul, Angles and Saxons in England. These represented whatever organized political power there was in Europe. Everything else belonged to the Roman Church. Moral authority, learning, the prestige of the Roman name, and the care of the people. It was to the bishop that ordinary people looked for leadership in Christian society. All this time, a process of assimilation was going on. The barbarians were converted to Christianity in the 5th and 6th centuries and acquired a thin Roman veneer. But as the barbarians were converted to Christianity, the church was increasingly barbarized. You can see this in the description that Gregory of Tours gives us of how things were in the kingdom of the Franks during the second half of the sixth century. Gregory, seen here in an illuminated manuscript from the 10th century, was himself a man of aristocratic Gallic lineage, 
a descendant of Roman officials, a member of a dynasty of bishops. But Frankish history, at least what we know of it from Gregory, is one long tale of arson and rape, murder and perjury, sons strangling their mothers, mothers throwing their sons down a well, people getting kicked or burned to death at a friendly banquet, wives encouraging their lovers to murder their husbands and then in due course murdering their daughters because they were afraid that they might tempt the lover away, incest, rife, and sometimes leading to murder, servants and allies betraying or poisoning their masters and their friends. This all came to a high point, or rather low point, with the death of Queen Brunhildis, who was captured along with her three sons by her enemies, tortured for three days, and on the fourth paraded round the camp on a camel in what state you can imagine. And then she was fastened by her hair, an arm and a foot to the tails of wild horses and torn limb from limb. But the fate of one of her sons is particularly interesting because even though two of the lads were killed at once, one happened to be the godson of the captor, and so he was spared and left to finish his life in a monastery, a good indication of the strength of religious bonds, even in a brutish, superstitious world. It was on these savage barbarians that the church was increasingly dependent. Consequently, the outward decline in the condition of culture was accompanied by a deterioration of moral standards among the clergy. We have to remember that these standards, at least at the higher levels, which are the only ones visible to us, continue to be those of the Roman world. So we shouldn't be surprised that bishops had slaves and concubines as other gentlemen did. But we also find bishops who wear mail and sword under their vestments, presumably for ready use, and who despoil poor men of their holdings and sometimes of their wives as well. There is a scene at the table of a Frankish king where two bishops accuse each other of licentiousness and there are many scenes where the bishops get so drunk that they can't even recognize their guests. The world which Gregory of Tours describes is a world of violence and corruption in which rulers set the example of injustice and contempt for the law and where even the barbaric virtues like loyalty and military honor are no longer preserved. In such a world, religion was able to maintain its power only by the terror and the awe that its supernatural prestige sometimes inspired, and by the threat of spiritual violence which it used to protect itself from the physical violence of barbarism. Fear of the wrath of God, fear of the vengeance of the saints, these were the only things that might intimidate the lawless ruffians who were so common among the new ruling classes. This is the period when saints played their most important part. Here, for instance, is Saint Cuthbert, who once revived a dying baby with a kiss. In the Dark Ages, saints were not merely models of moral perfection whose prayers were invoked by the church. They were very pragmatic forces who played a constant part in daily life, intervening in very practical ways so that the fishermen of Naples scourged their saints when they caught no fish. <laughs> 
saints were in effect supernatural powers and they were thought to live in the sanctuaries from which they could watch over the welfare of their land and their people. The most important saint for Gregory was St. Martin whose shrine at Tours was considered a fountain of grace and miraculous healing to which the sick came from every part of Gaul. St. Martin was thought to be particularly good against epilepsy and impotence. The shrine at Tours was destroyed in 853 and it was replaced several times, this one being the latest version. The original shrine was a sanctuary where fugitive slaves, escaped criminals, people outlawed by the king could all find refuge and supernatural protection. As a result, it was chock full of refugees. In principle, any church was supposed to provide sanctuary, but it had to be a pretty important saint who could actually frighten the great lords or the king from robbing the saint's property or from shedding blood on his premises. Those churches that were spared owed it largely to the power of their patron saint. And so the early centuries of the Middle Ages see the rise of a new Christian mythology in the West. The legends of the saints, like Saint Iriex here, which represented the other side of the dark picture of barbarian society that Gregory wrote about. On one side, we see a world of violence and injustice, which is sinking to destruction by its own weight. On the other side, there's the world of divine power and mystery in which man is freed from the harsh necessities of daily experience, where nothing is impossible because the saint can bring children back to life or provide food and drink, where every human suffering can find a remedy because the saint can heal the sick and feed the poor and even purify the guilty. Now, in this twilight world, it was inevitable that the Christian saint should acquire some of the features of the witch doctor on the one hand and the demigod on the other, that his prestige should depend upon his power as a wonder worker, and that men should appeal to him very much as they used to appeal to the family gods or to the local gods of the ancients as a patron of the family, as a patron of the community. It was only in this world of Christian mythology that the vital fusion of the Christian faith and ethics with the barbaric tradition of the new peoples could have been achieved. It was obviously impossible for peoples without any tradition or philosophy without any written literature, to assimilate directly the subtle, profound theology and metaphysics of the great doctors of the church. The barbarians could understand and accept the spirit of the new religion only when it was manifested to them, obviously, visibly, in the lives and the acts of men who seemed endowed with supernatural qualities. So the conversion of Western Europeans was not achieved so much by a new doctrine as by a new power that impressed them and subdued them. The Christian missionaries themselves were powerful personalities, brave, hardy, inspiring enthusiasm and trust and there were women saints as well as men. Valberga, who practiced medicine among the Saxons and who is remembered on the night of May the 1st, Walpurgisnacht. And Saint Audrey, 
abbess of Ely, whose feast on June the 23rd was so popular that it became famous for its annual fairs. The cheap tromperies and necklaces on sale there gave the name to tawdry. Women also played an important part in the conversion of the pagans at the political level. In 496, a Catholic princess of Burgundy, Clotilda, married Clovis, king of the Franks, and helped to convert him to Christianity. A hundred years later, Clotilda's great-granddaughter, Bertha, married and converted this man, Ethelbert, king of Kent, and their offspring carried Christianity from Kent to Northumbria. In 987, the Hungarians were Christianized by Stephen, later Saint Stephen, who was baptized by his mother and encouraged by his wife. This was not pillow talk, of course. It was a matter of alliances and political interests. But whatever the reasons, wives played an important role in such conversions. Then, once Christianity was accepted by the nobles, the church's prohibition of incest began to change the political face of Europe. It meant that the network of royal marriages was going to spread from Ireland to Constantinople, from Castile to Novgorod, avoiding the disadvantages of inbreeding, but also intertwining a group of families highly selected for their abilities in government and war. And the church's prohibition of polygamy meant that, theoretically at least, bastards were excluded from succession to the throne. Now, it took a long time to convince the ruling classes to abide by such exclusions. Still, gradually, it would no longer be necessary to murder all your brothers to be safe. Succession to the throne was clarified and stabilized, all of which had its uses. The main thing, however, is that the Western Church did not come to the barbarians with a civilizing mission or with any promise of political and social progress. It came with a tremendous message of divine judgment and divine salvation. Humanity was born under a curse. It was enslaved by the dark powers of cosmic evil. It was sinking ever deeper under the burden of its own guilt. Now this was obvious enough. And it was only by way of the cross. It was only by the grace of the crucified Redeemer, or better still, of Christ in majesty that men could extricate themselves from the damned mass of unregenerate humanity, could escape from the wreckage of a doomed world. The world was falling to pieces, it was coming to an end, and so it was natural for Christians to turn their eyes to the other world, to the eternal city rather than to an earthly one, and to the church, which offered the only avenue towards it. The argument was so convincing that while chaos continued and increased in the Western world, all the activities and the aspirations that we call cultural were concentrated in and on the church, the tradition of Latin culture the patterns of Christian life were not going to be preserved or developed in the cities which fell more and more into ruins, but in monasteries. And the monks would become not only the apostles of the West, but also the founders of medieval culture. Men and women withdrawing from the world to find salvation as isolated hermits or in small communities were not a new phenomenon. 
Christians had begun to do this in the Egyptian and Syrian desert from the third century on. But this sort of thing is easier to do in Egypt where you can go and dig a hole in the sand or build a little hut out of reeds, out of mud, and doze through most of the day. It's easier to do it there than it is further north in Germany or France, or even just across the Mediterranean in Italy, where winter can be very cold. So harsh climates posed a problem to the monastic life, and so did discipline, given the chaos around. These were the problems St. Benedict addressed when he set up his first monastery on Monte Cassino, south of Rome, in 520, and when he drew up rules for his community in or around 529. The Benedictines may be taken as typical of all the older monastic orders. They took a lifelong vow to observe obedience, poverty, and chastity. These were supported on four main precepts. No private property, no eating of butcher's meat except in case of sickness, steady manual labor, and strict confinement within the monastery itself. Benedict recommended three or four hours a day to be spent reading devotional books, although he made allowance for those who couldn't read. But everybody had to spend four or five hours a day in prayer and religious services. This public prayer became increasingly important as time went on, and the average monk did less and less manual work and concentrated on praying for his fellow men. So by a curious paradox, the monk who abandoned the world to save his own soul found that one of his major tasks was the job of interceding with heaven on behalf of his fellow men. The rule of St. Benedict is a model of practical and spiritual wisdom, even to recommending how monks should sleep. They shall sleep separately in separate beds. A candle shall always be burning in their cell until early in the morning. They shall sleep clothed and girt with belts or ropes, and they shall not have their knives at their sides, lest perchance in a dream they should wound the sleepers. But like a lot of great documents, the rule of St. Benedict became in time more a statement of what should be than an indication of what actually was. Property and meat crept in, work and abstinence went out. In spite of repeated reforms, monasteries became more businesslike and more worldly. This isn't surprising when you consider that in a troubled, violent, unsafe world, monasteries and convents afforded shelter and a minimum of order and comfort to a greater extent and for longer periods of time than any other residential establishment. The shelter wasn't merely physical, of course, it was spiritual too. Men and women crept into monasteries out of the cold, chilled to the marrow by the wickedness and wildness outside, envisaging the cloister as a refuge where they could keep warm in the faith. They could also maintain what bits and pieces of civilization were left, copying and illustrating old manuscripts when they weren't scraping them off to make room for something else. And they could spread the Christian message by missionary work, not just by sending out fiery preachers, but by example. Monasteries were sited in rural areas, and it was the monks who converted illiterate and heathen peasant populations, and who also probably introduced agricultural and technological improvements that were going 
to change the quality of life all over Europe. The Dark Ages must have been incredibly dismal, with raids and counter-raids, ambushes, robberies, murder, looting, kidnapping, torture, and drunken brawls ending in bloodshed, and hands and ears and noses cut off, which was considered a more Christian treatment of criminals or enemies than putting them to death. But through all this, life went on in burgs and monasteries and fortified manors. People maintained a minimal security. Merchants traveled on the old Roman roads. They were robbed once and twice, but they went on trading. Above all, men and women went on sowing, harvesting, driving the pigs into the forest, driving the cattle out to pasture to feed themselves and their masters as best they could. Next time, we shall see how the Dark Ages came to an end, although not the darkness. <laughs>